my op-ed is going to be on growth attenuation therapy. Um, let's start off with some background. For those of you that don't know, growth attenuation therapy, uh, it kind of it was a hormone therapy where you administer short-term but high dose um, of estrogen, and you can do that transdermally via the skin, um, using patches, or orally, you can take it via the mouth, and that causes early onset of puberty and premature mature premature maturation of growth plates, which reduces in um, reduces their height, their final height, aka it stunts their growth, basically. And it originated in the 50s, and believe it or not, it used to be used strictly to limit growth in tall adolescent girls for cosmetic or aesthetic purposes. So in the 50s, 60s, and even the 70s, um, estrogen has been used as a growth attenuating agent in females for whom the prospect of, for ex excess height was viewed as a disability. That's crazy to me now. Um, but now they are using this therapy um, for children with severe cognitive, developmental, physical disabilities. Um, and the first um, documented usage of growth attenuation therapy to limit the growth of a severely disabled child was reported in 2006 in the United States. Um, and the little girl's name was Ashley, and it is now um, more widely known as the Ashley treatment because of the incredible publicity that her and her family received when they did this therapy. So the little girl, she was six years old, and she was born where she had static encephalop encephalopathy resulting in profound cognitive, physical, um, developmental disabilities. And her brain is reported to have stopped developing at about three months. Um, I've gotten all of this information from Wrigley, Will Fond, and Hamilton's articles. Uh, but yes, she was uh, six years old at the time of treatment. And her parents' intention is to improve her quality of life by um, causing her to remain a size at which family activities remained possible. Um, it would let her parents lift and move her more easily, which the parents believed would allow her to participate in more social and recreational activities, which and would also help them with routine activities like getting her dressed, changing her diapers, um, and moving her out and about the house. Um, Will Fond estimated that the growth attenuation therapy reduced Ashley's height from 5'4 to 4'6, but as some of the articles have pointed out, that's really difficult to predict. Um, height and weight and everything is difficult to predict, which is one of the criticisms of the um, therapy, actually. But in response to the complaints that the hospital received regarding the Ashley treatment, Disability Rights Washington conducted an investigation into Seattle Children's Hospital, and following negotiations, the hospital agreed to obtain a court order before they administer um, growth attenuation therapy to children with developmental disabilities, as cited by Will Fond. Um, other hospitals and physicians aren't bound to such requirements, but the publicity and the public outrage that this case garnered um, got this hospital to agree that they would have court interventions prior to ever giving out growth attenuation therapy again. According to Wrigley, only a small number of children have undergone, severely disabled children have undergone um, GAT, and the, these authors specifically only knew about six children in New Zealand, two in the United States, and one in South Korea. So definitely more research needs to be done with this population in order to um, be, it, to become a more evidence-based practice, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many of the researchers that I read. Starting with the pros, in um, Allen's research paper, they uh, decided that GAT is an innovative and sufficiently safe therapy that offers the possibility of an improved quality of life for non-ambulatory children with profound cognitive disabilities and their families. They define profound cognitive disability as including non-ambulation and requiring assistance with nearly every aspect of daily living, um, as well as remaining completely dependent on others for even basic care. A lot of the research that I looked through um, that was one of the main requirements, that the children had to be severely cognitively disabled. Um, Will Fond and his colleagues also agreed that GAT can be an ethically acceptable decision because the benefits and risks are similar to those associated with other decisions that parents make for their profoundly disabled children. 
Um, it's important, however, to have safeguards in place, such as eligibility criteria, a thorough decision-making process, and the involvement of ethics consultants or committees. Growth attenuation can be morally permissible under specific conditions and after thorough consideration. So this is what I was talking about with the eligibility. Um, they wrote that the child should have persistent, profound developmental and intellectual impairments. As a result, these children require total care by others, including feeding, dressing, toileting, and mobility assistance, determination of which would require periodic developmental assessments in which the child shows little pro progress in motor, communicative, and social and emotional development past infantile stage. Um, and the child's IQ would have to be less than 20 to 25. Um, and that was pretty much what I found in every single article, anyone who was for GAT, decided that it would need to be limited to this small group of children with profound disabilities. Um, we need to encourage more welcoming societal attitudes towards individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, the parents of these children, um, they face complicated challenges and they should be afforded the respect and considerable deference in making the complex decisions unique to their child's care. Um, listed as reasons for treatment in Wrigley's writings, were allowing parents to care for their child at home more easily, making it easier for the child to take part in family activities, it reduces or eliminates the need for professional caregivers, it improves the child's quality of life, it keeps the child a size more in line with their developmental age, and it reduces seizures and improves muscle tones. Um, basically, the primary benefits were to improve the quality of life for the children and to uh, increase the child's involvement in um, family and recreational activities. Like, there was a really um, moving anecdote that I found in the research. Um, it's a mother of a 15-year-old daughter who's nonverbal, quadriplegic, fed through a gastronomy tube, and requires assistance with all activities of daily living. Um, once she underwent puberty, she had an enormous growth spurt and is now five foot one and 85 pounds. And unfortunately, now her parents are no longer able to take her to many of her favorite places or activities, um, and their ability to travel with her via the car or plane um, is seriously limited now. Her parents' aging bodies, her height and um, her growth spurt, and the development of her knee flexion contractures, which has deprived her of the ability to bear weight and limit her comfort time in her wheelchair, have greatly limited her life experiences. Um, she can no longer assist with transfers. She can't stand or dance with Barney in front of the TV. She can't go down the slide or jump on the trampoline like she used to. And she can no longer be supported in the swing at the local park. They did install a lift in their home, and that's one of the arguments that people make, that you should just use a lift. Why do you have to change their bodies? But mechanical lifts and motorized vehicles are not universally available or affordable, so many of these families only have access to that if they're lucky in their home and in their school. It's not assisting them in any recreational activity, so it further isolates the child. Um, and the mother also makes a really good point. Diaper changes and positional changes at night can't be managed by a lift, and they too have become increasingly difficult as Jessica has gotten older. This mother believes that GAT is a creative solution born out of deep-seated love for a child whose opportunities for familial and social interaction are already limited by size and mobility issues. She also believes that personalized medical care should allow individual families to make informed decisions within the medical and moral boundaries that they are found that are found in the hospitals they frequent. Um, so, in other words, parents should be able to make these decisions about their child's life, you know, with a group of physicians, obviously, but they should be able to make these decisions on an individual basis. Now, for the criticisms um, and those against uh, growth attenuation therapy. One of the huge points that is made in almost every single article um, is in line with the social model of disability. Um, one of my favorite quotes was that some people with disabilities and their advocates view GAT primarily as a sign that medical professionals and parents without disabilities neither respect people with disabilities as they are nor work to accommodate their bodies. That's found in Will Fon's article. Um, the social model of disability, for those that need a reminder, is that the locus of disability lies not in the individual's impairment, but rather in physical, social, economic, and political and cultural barriers erected by society. Um, 
So as one of the people in Allen's article wrote, the wrongness of GAT is that it involves a failure to love and embrace the child with the characteristics and capacities that she has. Disabilities right groups, um, rights groups assert that disability results from an interaction between an individual and his or her environment, and that changes in the environment should be preferred to the manipulations of the patient's body. We should be making public environments and the workplace more accessible to people with non-standard modes of functioning. We can alter society to better accommodate children with profound disabilities, and GAT appears to perpetuate the notion that disabled bodies should accommodate a society that does not accept disability. So I understand both sides of the coin, and I think that these are all um, good arguments. And here is an anecdote from a mother um, who is against growth attenuation therapy. She's a mother of a 28-year-old son who's legally blind, quadriplegic, nonverbal, autistic, profoundly intellectually disabled, prone to seizures and sleep disturbances, and who is also 6 feet tall and 190 pounds. She is against the idea, essentially, that he needs to be fixed. This is her general argument. Um, she says he's loved, he's happy, he has a good life, he has friends and interests, and she would never want him to feel that she is dissatisfied with him just as she is. She would have never wanted him to feel like she needed him to be different. And she states that GAT should be out of bounds unless it treats an underlying disorder. The human rights of the child as a person should limit parental rights. Other arguments against GAT cite discrimination. If GAT should not be done on children without these impairments, meaning the persistent, profound, developmental, and intellectual impairments that are, then it should not be done on any children. To do otherwise amounts to discrimination. And she, other arguments against GAT cites um, the level of the child's comprehension. Basically, that we know little about what people with severe cognitive disabilities can comprehend really determine their cognitive abilities. That is cited in Ash's article against growth attenuation. Um, so while there are arguments on both sides of the coin, I think that um, it's a it's a heated debate for a reason. People feel very strongly. On both sides, the people for it think that it should be a decision that each family gets to make, and if it can improve the quality of life for children who, whose lives are difficult as is, then why not give them that option? Meanwhile, people on the other side of the coin think that, you know, they're kind of playing God, and they are making decisions that might just be easy for them. And their child might not agree with those decisions, but it's hard to determine that because the child might not be verbal or won't be able to communicate, you know, what they need or, or how they determine their identity. So while I understand both sides, I believe that it should be left to each individual family. And we definitely, we need more information. And I mean, there are a lot of recommendations for practice, which I, overall, there is a need for more information. Um, I think it should be a shared decision-making process. I think that the child's physicians need to be involved. Um, as researchers have written, there need to be, um, each case should be reviewed by neurobehavioral specialists, um, ethics committees, which was written in every single research paper I read. They all agree that ethics committees should be involved. Um, endocrinologists. And that a thorough case-by-case -case evaluation of harms and benefits to the child should be done. In order for it to be acceptable, I think that, I do think that it should be restricted to the children with persistent, profound, developmental, and intellectual impairments. Um, and I think that it, it should be a decision that each family is given the respect to, to make for themselves, but that we still do need input from obviously professionals who have experience with this and to make sure that it is the right decision for each individual family. And if you would please go watch a YouTube video. It is called Family Stunts Daughter's Growth to Expand World. And it is about one of the more recent cases of growth attenuation on a little girl named Charlie Hooper. And her family um, decided to undergo growth attenuation therapy, and it has helped her, and it'll give you a little bit of her family's perspective. So thank you for listening, and that is what I know about growth attenuation therapy.